everybody. sanctuary here with us or joining us online we welcome you happy mother's day to all the mothers grandmothers aunts uh, those who are surrogate mothers grandmothers aunts uh, you you take care of us you treat us well you uh, discipline us uh, you, you uh, encourage us at times too so we we thank you and we are glad that you are here and joining us and we hope you have a great mother's day today so I'm going to invite Donna to come forward and, and lead us our open scripture and have our open prayer together. Good morning. This morning we're out of Psalms 111. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. He gives food to those who fear him. He always remembers his covenant. He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true, to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise him forever, will you pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon as one body, as one church, Lord. We come to dive deeper into your word. We come to listen to the message that you've prepared through Pastor Darren. We come to obey and to give thanks and to praise your holy name. So we give thanks for this afternoon. We give thanks for the ability to come together as one. We give thanks for your message this afternoon. And we ask that you would bless each and every one of us as we head into this time of study and fellowship and worship. We pray these things in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand this morning as you are able to as we worship this morning. Uh, as we open with come, uh, we don't, wrong song, hold on. Awake my soul. It is one o'clock in the afternoon. I hope you're already awake, but I hope that this wakes your soul. <laughs>
And the honey sweet. So you love this city and you love these streets. Every child out playing by its own front door. Every baby laying on the bedroom floor. Every dreamer dreaming in their garden job. Every driver driving to the rush hour mall. I feel it in my spirit, feel it in my bones. We're gonna send revival, bring them all back home. Well, I can hear that thunder in the distance, like a train on the edge of the town. hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, is a hymn that reminds us of really two key attributes of who God is, God of Grace and God of Glory. As we go into our time of prayer this morning, may this, all right, let's do it this way. In the, in the um, few pockets in front of you, there's a hymnal. 
if I invite you to pull the hymnal out and find God of grace and God of glory. Uh, my apologies that I pulled the wrong music. My, my fault. So, thank you. Um, what's, what's, the na- what's the number? No. Uh, no. no, the song of God. Uh, the wrong song is up there. Yeah. So. Hold on. No, it's not. Okay, I need to be more caffeine or less caffeine. That is the correct song. Grace greater than our sin. Is that what you have? Yes. Okay. Grace greater than our sin. I'm going to get it right one of these years. So. into our time of prayer uh, today, uh, but before we do so, I just want to take just a moment to, to recognize the mothers here. I believe we have a lot, lot of different mothers, grandmothers, and for those who are online, we welcome you as well. Uh, it is an amazingly important position that you hold, and I know that we all, always don't get it right, whether as mothers or as uh, fathers, but we uh, want to bless you this morning, pray for you specifically, and thank you for all that you have done in the raising of kids and grandkids, even neighborhood kids, and how important that is uh, in, the, in our lives as we have grown up. As we enter into our time of prayer today, I want to sh- ask for your prayer requests. Are there prayer requests that you'd like to share? Bonnie.
other prayer requests. Um, I'm aware. I'm aware of the um, needs in the schools as well. The uh, I know there's a lot of budgetary issues in school districts. Uh, budgetary issues uh, in dealing with uh, next year. Uh, there's been some changes, or will be some changes in Dallas as to where students go and classrooms and things like that. And so uh, just remember the school districts in prayer as they go, uh, as they end this year and begin the next year as well. Other prayer requests to share? As I begin the prayer today, I wanted to just say a, a special prayer over the mothers. So would you join me in prayer this morning, this afternoon? Loving God, we thank you for the gift of motherhood. Today we celebrate the loving sacrifice of mothers, biological, adopted, neighborhood, and spiritual, who nurture and guide us in your ways. Bless them with joy, with strength, and with love to continue their selfless devotion. Grant them the strength to face the daily challenges with courage and the wisdom to guide their children toward a life of faith and service. Encourage them when they are weary and inspire them when they feel overwhelmed. Hear our prayer for mothers who face hardships and trials, whether they deal with health issues, financial stress, relational struggles, be their rock and their fortress. We pray this, this afternoon that you help mothers across the world to be a blessing to their children and to those who are a part of their lives, whether delivering affirmations or guidance. I pray that you, I pray that you help every word and action to be done in love and pray that children worldwide will take time to honor their mothers, that you'll show them how to do so uniquely. Provide them with your protection and provision. Let your presence be a comforting reminder that they are not alone in their journey. I say this prayer to you in gratitude and praise for the gift of mothers. My mother, those of my friends, relatives, those I'll never know, all, all mothers. Thank you for the role they play in the family unit. Thank you for their teachings, their wisdom, their patience and understanding. Thank you for the physical, emotional, and spiritual gifts they possess. I pray that these mothers also act as a blessing beyond their households, reaching into their extended families, communities, churches, and schools. I pray that the impact of motherhood is revered throughout society and that these women are acknowledged for their everyday impact on the world. May you guide each of them into fulfilling their purpose here on earth. May they feel deeply appreciated and honored, not just today, but every day. And Lord, we continue in prayer this morning for those who are in need of healing. Lord, we know that you are the ultimate healer. And you have gifted men and women uh, to be healers alongside you, whether it be spiritual miracles, whether it be they be the doctors and nurses, EMTs, family practitioners, physicians assistants, and so many others who Help us in our healing. We pray, Lord, for your healing and your strength, however it may come. And Lord, we specifically lift to you Maria this morning as she is having heart surgery this next week. We pray, Lord, for your, your hand of grace upon her and especially upon the doctors and nurses that you might give them focus. Lord, for those who are grieving, we pray for you, their comfort. Uh, we grieve so many different things, Lord. Uh, losses of family members and pets, of friendships and other relationships, of dreams and hopes, of things that sometimes we just don't understand. Yet we cling to you in your comfort. We cling to you in all that, that you have given to us. And so, Lord, we pray that in this time you will bring us comfort. We continue to pray for our community especially, Lord, the school districts in this area and really across the state that are struggling with, with budgetary issues, struggling with different things that are, are going on in their districts and in the individual schools, the changes that will take place this coming year. Lord, we pray for the teachers, for those who are in the classrooms, that you will give them strength, that you will give them uh, inspiration as they invest their lives into the students 
at whatever age they are. We pray, Lord, for our leaders, our national leaders, our local leaders, leaders around this world, Lord, that you will help them to work for peace, that you'll help them to, to see the uniqueness in all people, and that they will work in ways that uplift that. We pray, Lord, for your hand of grace with them, your hand of inspiration that guides them. We pray for this congregation, Lord, as we too go through transition times. And as we look toward where you are guiding and leading us, for Lord, you are present. Yet you haven't shown us exactly where to go. But Lord, I believe that you are leading us. And our desire to follow you pleases you. So Lord, let us renew our commitment to following you in all things. Renew our commitment to service, to take care of one another, and to take care of those in our community as well. Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you read my email that I sent out last night, I kind of asked you to think, what reminds you of springtime? Is there anybody who has an idea of what reminds them of springtime? I've got some suggestions here we'll look at, but I want to see what you came up with. What's that? Flowers. Let's go to the next slide. Blooming, beautiful flowers. I mean, I don't know who, who has a garden, who has a yard, who doesn't have some kind of flowers that are blooming. Um, go to the next one. Beautiful trees. If you have trees in your yard, uh, or trees just you, that you see along the side of the road, you can see that they're blooming or leafing out, and they're just absolutely beautiful. Go on to the next one. Allergies. I mean, I, I relate to that 100%. Allergies are just a sign of springtime in a lot of different ways. Road construction signs. Come out in the springtime. They are, yep, yep, there is road work ahead, so. And uh, this, this one's going to date me a little bit. Maybe, maybe you think of, of Klinger wearing a flower hat, uh, because it's spring when asked why he's wearing it. That's one of my favorite scenes in, in that show, so I had, to, I had to put it up there. Anyway, springtime is a time of, of transition, of new things, of excitement, of possibilities. There's a lot of things that remind us of springtime. And as we look at the scripture of this morning, we're going to find something else, at least in biblical times, that is a sign of spring. And it's, it's important for the story. So uh, we'll see that right at the first. So let's go on and read the scripture this morning. It comes from 2 Samuel 11. And it's long, and it's involved, and there's a lot of drama and stuff that goes on. So, so follow along as best you can. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. Did you know that was a sign of spring? that kings go off to war, so remember that. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was and how the soldiers were and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and 
died. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. As was mentioned in our men's Bible study this past week, this could have been a, uh, a show like at Dallas or Falcon Crest. Again, that dates me a little bit. But all the drama, all the, the con con conniving and cunning and things like that that were happening. And actually, I cut out some of the story because it's, it's actually a really long story. I encourage you to go back to uh, 2 Samuel 11 and read the whole thing. Because if we look at this story, this is probably, well, this is not probably, this is not David's greatest moment. We often think of, of King David in his role as a shepherd boy. Or maybe in defeating Goliath. Or becoming king because God saw his heart. But this is not David's finest moment. And maybe you're familiar with the story. Maybe this is the first time you've heard this before. But I want us to focus for a moment on what happened on, on this story. It's full of drama, full of, of uh, intrigue, full of murder, full of uh, lies and cover-ups and the whole works. David saw this beautiful woman bathing, cleansing herself from her, her monthly uncleanliness as the rites, as the rituals uh, stated in the law. He lusted after her, and because he was king, he could call her, have her come to his, his bedroom, and pretty much have his way. She became pregnant, and he called her husband back from, from the battle. And two nights, he tried to get him to go home, go back to his home and sleep with his wife. And one of the, that second night, he got him drunk thinking that would lower his inhibitions. But it didn't work. And so David sent him back with a letter to the commander, basically saying, put Uriah up front, where he's going to get killed. You see, David, according to to being king, could do whatever he wanted to. He had immunity. He could do whatever, whatever he wanted to do. His, his word was law. His word was what everybody went by. Even though if they didn't agree with it, even if they, they knew it was wrong, king said it, that settles it. We might say he had absolute power. In this case, it absolutely corrupted him. So let's look at some of the things that David did wrong to begin with. Number one is in that first verse. King was supposed to go off to war. It was springtime. But he didn't. He did not lead his armies into battle. He sent... Instead, he sent his armies, he sent commanders, he sent his other military leaders, said, hey, go, go and do those things. I'm going to sit here in, in comfort, in peace. So he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't where he was called to be as the leader of Israel at that time. And while we may sit here and think, you know, that's awfully silly to think, you know, the king had to go off to war and, and do that. He could, he could have just sent his his generals, his leaders. But that wasn't the way it was done. Then, sometime after they left for, for the war, he was walking along the palace one night. And that's not, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with walking along the roof of the palace. But when he saw Bathsheba bathing, doing the ritual cleansing, doing those things that, she, that were required of her, he stopped and he lusted. And it wasn't just a passing, 
trance, he stopped and dwelt and lusted after Bathsheba. But he didn't stop there. He called her to his, his room, his bedroom. They had sex, and she got pregnant. But he wasn't done. He tried to cover it up by getting his, her husband so that he could pretend that the baby was, was his. And then when that didn't work, He had him killed, murdered him. He may not have used, shot the arrow or, or swung the sword, but David had him murdered. And the story goes on to say then that um, David brought Bathsheba into his, in, back into the palace and, and basically made, made her his wife. And she gave birth to a son. David still tried to cover it up. Tried to pretend that nothing else had happened. And then we get to chapter 12, where Nathan, the prophet, comes to David, or is sent to David. And I just want to read you this short story that Nathan tells David. It's not going to be on the screen, but I just want to read this to you. David said, or, I'm sorry, Nathan said to David, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to, to David, you are that man. Eventually, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The story that Nathan told him, the discussions that they had in that, in that time, in that process, finally got David to recognize, yeah, okay, I messed up. I sinned not, not only against Bathsheba and Uriah and, and say the army and the, the leaders, but I've sinned against God. I've sinned against God. Now what do I do? Now what's going to happen to me? God's grace is amazing. Nathan said to him, the Lord has taken away your sin and you are not going to die. But there are consequences, David. There are consequences to your actions. There are consequences to all that has, has transpired. And Nathan said to David, the son that Bathsheba has birthed will die. And the story goes on that the child became sick, and David fasted and wept and mourned for seven days while this child was sick. And finally, after about seven days, the child died. And David stopped mourning. And the servants asked him, why don't you continue to mourn? The child has died. He said, yeah, I know. I was hoping that God may relent and allow the child to live. But now, the consequences have happened, as God said, and it's time to move on. And he did. He, he did move on. Yet, it absolutely changed his life. It absolutely changed his life. 
as part of what he did, I want to read to you a psalm that you're probably familiar with. A psalm, uh, Psalm 51. And this is a psalm at, as it's entitled. Psalm that David wrote when he was confronted by, with the sin of Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb and taught me the wisdom that is secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will not turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, for I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. It is easy to dwell on David's sin. That's the easy part. Yet David wrote this psalm, this beautiful psalm that I'm sure many of you are familiar with in one form or another, or, or at least parts of it. What is important is God's grace. David confessed his sin. God, I, I, I've sinned against you and you only. That is the very core of it. Yes, Bathsheba was involved. Yes, Uriah was involved. Yes, the armies were involved. Yes, all of these things were the specific acts, if you will. Yet David knew at the core of it, he had sinned against God. And just as Nathan said, God has taken away your sin. God has taken away your sin. That amazing grace that flows from God's throne to you and I, to David, to those who struggle with sin. That amazing grace is so prevalent and so needed. It's just like water that flows to the lowest parts of our lives. And so I want you to begin to think about this for a minute. Think about what that grace mean, meant for David. You see, David received that grace, and sometime in that process, he wrote this beautiful psalm. But it wasn't a psalm that just said, hey, God, please forgive me. I've sinned against you. You know my sin. Please forgive me. It was a, it was a psalm that also included, okay, I've received your grace now I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to proclaim your, your goodness. I'm going to proclaim your grace. I'm going to teach others about who you are. I'm going to do all these things because of what you've done in me. And to me, that's, that's very key. Because so often you and I, when there's some big sin in our lives, there's some big issue that we're, we're struggling with. I think sometimes it's easy to receive God's grace. But there are two struggles that we often have. One is that even though it's, easy to it's easier to understand and receive God's grace, we can't forgive ourselves. 
We dwell on the sin. We dwell on the past. We dwell on that struggle. And it keeps dragging us down. We can't dwell on the past. We can't dwell on the things that have happened before because it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't move us forward. And the second thing we need to understand, too, is when we receive God's grace, when we receive that grace that God gives to us, we have to forgive ourselves and we have to move forward. We have to say, okay, God, yeah, I've sinned against you. And I've hurt these different people. Or I've messed up in this way, in this way, in this way. And ultimately, God, it's a sin against you. So how do I make it right? Or how do I ask for forgiveness? Not only from you, but maybe from other people as well. And then how do I move forward into where you are calling me to go? David was still known as a man after God's own heart. David was still known as a good king. He didn't let that past sin weigh him down, hold him back, if you will. You know, I've, I've shared this before, this, this insane exercise that my daughters had to go through who were on the swim team. They got in the pool and they attached a harness around them, and the harness was attached to a bungee cord that was attached to the wall of the pool, and they had to swim and see how far they could swim against the bungee cord until it yanked them back. I've seen blow up houses that have something similar to that where you put a harness on and you, you run against this bungee cord until it yanks you back. That's what we allow sin to do for us. It yanks us back. That's how we let our past control us, is it yanks us back and we can't move forward. We need to take that harness off. We need to take that bungee cord and cut it so we can jump forward. And that is what happens when we receive God's grace and are redeemed from our failures. It's easy to, to remain in the past. It's easy to remain focused on that sin or that failure or that um, whatever it was that happened. Whether it was us that did it or somebody did it to us. But are we going to let that hold us back? Are we going to let that keep us locked in place so that we can't move forward? David said in the psalm, he said, I'm not going to let that happen. I want to tell others about your grace. I want to teach trespassers your ways. I want to teach people about who you are, God, because of what you've done for me. And he did. My question for us today, because God's ultimate amazing grace is available for you and I, God's ultimate powerful overwhelming, reckless love is available for us and given to us. But what are we going to do with it? Are we going to receive it? If we receive it, then we have to forgive ourselves as well. And we have to then move forward to say, okay, I'm going to step out of this, this rut, this sin, this I'm going to cut the bungee cord. I'm going to take the harness off. Whatever imagery you want there so that I can move forward to be what God's called me to be. God redeemed David from this drama of an event. I don't know how else to describe it. A horrendous drama that David not just participated in, but orchestrated but he finally came to terms and said yeah I did this God I sinned against you forgive me there's a confession there's a rece receiving of the grace and there's a moving forward you and I have that grace available to us God's ultimate unconditional love is available for us God's ultimate unconditional 
grace is there for us through Jesus Christ. And so when we come to God and say, God, you know, I sinned. Please forgive me. God reaches down and lifts us up and says, let's try this again. But he doesn't leave us there. He says, let's try this again and points us in the right direction. He says, keep going. Keep moving. David wasn't where he was supposed to be on that spring, springtime back in Jerusalem. And it got him in big trouble. A lot of trouble. He sinned against God. Yet he was redeemed by God. He was redeemed and given grace and forgiveness. He was redeemed and made new. And his heart was restored. His soul was made new in a way that is powerful in a way that is so very, very important because the same thing happens to you and I. No matter what drama, no matter what sin we're entangled in, God is present with us. And God's grace is there to lift us up and God's love can't get rid of it. But we receive that amazing grace that is so powerful to us. God redeems us and lifts us up out of the muck and out of the mire in ways that are so very important. So would you pray with me this morning as we receive God's grace. Lord, we confess to you that we are sinful and we are broken. Many times our hearts and our minds are far from you. We hold on to hurts that have been done to us. We hold on to stuff that we've done. So Lord, help us to open our hands and let them go. Because you have, you want to fill our hands and our hearts and our minds and our souls with your love and your grace. So Lord, as we come this afternoon, may we know your grace May we know your power within us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a couple songs as we prepare for our communion time, which Marshall will lead us in in just a few minutes. So I invite you this, this afternoon to join in singing Amazing Grace. Because God's, God's grace is amazing, and it's overwhelming, and it's completely powerful.
Earlier this week, Darren and I were having a conversation about fellowship, which is a part of communion. Um, and I, I have, I've wondered for some time since, since COVID, why some people who used to attend faithfully have not been coming back. And I know, unfortunately, we've lost a number of those people to death. But there are others that, you know, have, and, and health issues. But I wish everyone would remember the importance of us coming together and having the fellowship that we have when we meet here in person. That was one of the big things that was missing during that time when we only did online church was that fellowship with other believers. And so I, you know, I continue to pray. Well, I continue to pray for everybody in the church, but I mean, I just pray for those people who have maybe gotten out of the habit of coming the people who have forgotten the importance of that fellowship. And I just pray that they will recognize that importance. One of the, one of the things about preparing a communion message is finding the scripture. There are a number of them, and I tend to go to Matthew 26, 26 often because it, I can remember Matthew 26, 26. But that today I looked up communion scriptures. I've looked up communion before, but this time I looked up the communion scriptures specifically. And I found a very interesting article about communion in the Bible. It's from a group called, well, there's something in the beginning there, the Bible Study Tools staff. So it was kind of interesting. Um, it, it gives all the scriptures, and it says, here are important aspects about the significance and meaning of communion in the Bible. Communion originated during the Last Supper, where Jesus inaugurated the practice of sharing bread and wine with his disciples, instructing them to partake in remembrance of him. The use of bread and wine in communion symbolizes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, serving as a poignant reminder of his sacrificial death for the atonement of sins. Communion serves as a solemn moment for believers to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice and express gratitude for the profound redemption and forgiveness of sins achieved through his crucifixion and resurrection. The act of communion signifies the unity among believers in the body of Christ, illustri illustrating shared faith, fellowship, and a communal bond. Prior to participating in communion, believers are encouraged to engage in self-examination, confess sins, and approach the sacrament with a repentant heart, aligning with Paul's counsel in 1 Corinthians 11, 28-29. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Some Christian, some Christian traditions 
perceive communion as a conduit for spiritual nourishment through which believers receive grace and strength as they actively participate in this blessed sacrament. In summary, communion in the Bible is a human participation with Christ and fellow believers. It is an act of thanksgiving and faith in the redemptive work of Jesus for spiritual nourishment and self-reflection within the Christian community. It's also important to note that interpretations and practices of communion may differ among various Christian denominations. And then at the very, after listing all of the scriptures, they specifically list 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the fact that we have communion each week. Thank you for the reminders that it gives us, not only of your allowing Christ to die on the cross for our sins, but also as a reminder of the fellowship of all believers. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us greatly. And just be with us at the, throughout this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite those who choose to to come forward or to use the prepackaged elements that you could picked up on your way in. morning as we prepare for our benediction and closing songs, remind us of the importance of our gifts and offerings. Uh, today is our fill the cart Sunday where, um, and I know I forgot it, I had a, a wonderful lady remind me last Sunday about, hey, you forgot about uh, fill the cart, right? <laughs> um, but yes, the cart is back there. Uh, we, uh, we collect food every month for the Dallas Food Bank, and that is part of our offerings, our gifts to the community. We give in so many different ways. And each of those gifts helps us to be a blessing to the community in a variety of ways. Whether it's having the doors open here at the church and uh, presents where people can come in. Whether it's gifts to those who are in need, food for the food bank, the ability to host the dental van, all sorts of different things allow the church to be a place of peace and of hope for our community. So I encourage you to give. If you are online, go to our website at dallasfirstcc.com and give through the, the portal there. If you're here 
and would like to give in person here at the church. There's an offering box in the back there underneath the mirror uh, for you to give in that way. Your gifts are important because they're gifts, ultimately they're gifts to God. And how God takes them and uses them to bless not only us, but beyond us to the community and the world as well. Let us pray blessing over the gifts this morning. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the provisions and gifts you have provided us with in our lives. We offer up these gifts to you. Use them for your glory and to share your love and grace to our community and world. We continue to pray for your leading and provisions in our lives and the church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, some announcements for this morning. Uh, board meeting meets on Tuesday morning at 9.30 here at the church. So we encourage you to board members to be here for that. Women's Bible study is back on Wednesday morning at 9.30. Uh, be in the parlor area there as, uh, for, for your time of study. Men's Bible study will be Thursday at 8.30 in the morning. And we encourage you to come and be a part of that. It's a great time of fellowship and encouragement and prayer for one another. Uh, our most current family visitor and newslet family visitor newsletter and prayer brochure are at the back there. You can pick up. If you'd like electronic copies and haven't got those, let us know, and we'll be glad to email those out to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, Zoom prayer. We're going to try to adjust the schedule a little bit because with summertime, with everything going on, uh, with great weather, we're going to move uh, Zoom prayer and encouragement to just Friday at noon instead of Wednesday uh, and Friday. We're going to try just just Friday at noon. Um, to see how that works and see how that goes. We encourage you. It's, it's a good time of fellowship. Uh, we're not physically present, but we're present in spirit and present on the little, little screens. And so we encourage you to be there as, but, as best as you can and just to share, even if, even if it's for just a few minutes. Um, remember our current times. Just a reminder that we are meeting, uh, obviously those who are here remember that. Uh, but our time of study is at noon and our worship time is at 1 o'clock. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about Joseph and Esther and struggles in preparation. Joseph, uh, the Old Testament Joseph, coat of many colors, uh, Joseph. Uh, Esther, uh, many of you may not may know that name, Esther, but may not know her story. So Donna's going to bring us the message on Sunday, this next Sunday, and talk about how struggles often prepare us for ministry, for a time, that time such as this, as Esther says. Yet, oftentimes, we look at those struggles in our lives and we say, God's, God's not blessing me. I'm struggling too much. But we don't see what God's ultimately doing. So we look forward to that message next week on uh, the struggles and preparation for, for what God's got for us. Celebrations. We have birthdays this week. Uh, none of them are here this morning, but I encourage you to, to wish them happy birthdays as best you can. Uh, if you see them in the community or online, to do, to do so. And they're also listed on the half bulletin sheets that are available as well. Oh. In its beginning, every... Go ahead, go ahead. In its beginning, every congregation is new. In su comienzo, toda congregación es nueva. It's right there in the book of Acts. Ahí está en el libro de los hechos. How early disciples came together. Cómo los primeros discípulos se unían compartiendo todas las cosas en común. Sharing all things in common. Partiendo el pan con corazones alegres y generosos. Breaking bread with glad and generous hearts. Juntos damos nuestra ofrenda de Pentecostés 2024 para apoyar a los discípulos que se reúnen hoy. Together we give our 2024 Pentecost offering to support disciples coming together. La mitad de nuestra ofrenda Pentecostés apoya a los discípulos que se reúnen aquí en Oregon y al suroeste de Idaho. One half of our Pentecost offering supports disciples coming together here in Oregon and Southwest Idaho. The other half of our Pentecost offering supports disciples coming together across the United States and Canada. La otra mitad de Pentecostés apoya a los discípulos que se reúnen en los Estados Unidos y en Canadá. Creating a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. Creando un movimiento de integridad en un mundo fragmentado.
we can give through our congregation, through our regional office, directly online. Search for DMS Give Online. Podemos darla en nuestras iglesias y decirles que es para el ministerio de nuestras iglesias. Podríamos enviarlo a nuestra oficina regional o directamente en línea a DMSF Pentecostés. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, the celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the early church. And we've heard that story time and time again. And uh, sometimes I think we miss the power in that story. The Disciples of Christ has several different special offerings throughout the year. One of those is at Pentecost, where we, get, get, where we have the opportunity to give a special gift to help start new churches. On the screen in the video, you saw several new churches that have been started uh, in our region, uh, Hispanic churches, uh, Chiquise churches, Pacific Islander churches, all sorts of different uh, brands, if you will, of, of churches. And there are others as well that are in formation, too. Uh, new churches have something special to offer communities, whether it's uh, based upon a different language uh, sometimes they offer special life, a new energy. And so we have the opportunity to contribute and to help uh, with that special offering. And like the video said, half of, that, half of our offerings will stay here in, in Oregon and Southwest Idaho to help the new churches starting here. And half of it will go to the general church, new church uh, program, where they do the training and the uh, resources for new church starts around the country as well. So I encourage you uh, to pick it up. I will have more information out next week and available for you uh, to, to look at and ways in which you can give. Other announcements that I've forgotten about this morning? I think I got them all. All right, would you stand as we sing our closing song this morning? David was a man who sang and he sang joyously, and he sang passionately. And I can imagine him singing a song like this uh, after he recognized God's grace in his life. So let's sing Joyful, The One Who Saves. <laughs>
this morning having received God's amazing unconditional love and grace may you go forward in that grace and that love to be the, the women and the men that you are called to be as the church in our world go in peace go in grace and go in love amen